we've never had more photo education opportunities than we do right now. And it turns out maybe it's not just about online versus in person. We can also talk about interactive versus pre-recorded. And even expert photographers can benefit and learn from a workshop that's been set up by an instructor to help them gain from it. Join me for a quick tour through the photo education reality with experienced photographer and educator Steve Simon. Let's dive right in. This is great. Hey there, everyone. I am excited to be back here today. We're going to have a conversation. I'm joined by Steve Simon, as you can see, who is a longtime photographer, educator, podcaster, uh, author, um, someone I crossed paths with, I think, first in the photography world, probably, I mean, God, probably 15 years ago at this point. Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's been a while. Um, and today we're going to chat a little bit about... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'll chat a little bit about photo education and Steve's take on that. Um, he's got, a, a, you know, a couple upcoming workshops. Um, you know, one he's leaving for, what do you say? You're leaving tomorrow, actually? I'm leaving tomorrow, yes, to go to Lisbon. Uh, fun, fun. And then it you've got another fun. workshop in Tokyo coming up in about a month. And we'll, we'll chat maybe yeah. a little bit more about that later. But first of all, for folks who aren't familiar with you, who haven't crossed paths with you 15 years ago like I did, um, why don't you let folks know just a little bit about kind of your background as a photographer and educator? Sure. Well, I got into photography, I think I was 11. Um, my brand is The Passionate Photographer. I wrote a book called The Passionate Photographer. Uh, haven't read it, but it's got good reviews. Um, I've been a lifelong <laughs> photographer. And, you know, the, the passion that I had as a kid roaming the streets of my native Montreal, uh, doing more street and documentary, you know, sort of launched my career into newspaper and photojournalism. And uh, here I am today doing mostly workshops and teaching, sharing my passion with other passionate photographers. And and I think, Aaron, that I'm, I'm, I'm more passionate now than I was then. And, you know, I think for a lot of us who have found photography, we understand that it is such a blessing because it, you know, the, 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 the um, experience of being a photographer uh, only gets, it, it's only enhanced, I think, with, with time. As you get to certain levels, you keep sort of pushing. I think the best is yet to mm -hmm. come often as you get older because when I look at my photographic heroes, they're doing their best work, you know, in their 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. 80s, 90s even. And, and for me, um, I understand that. And, and it also makes me think, yeah, there's always room to sort of move forward, you know, with our, with our art. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that is interesting in photography is obviously when you've got, you know, when you're young or when you're brand new to photography, you know, you're kind of coming in with that fresh set of eyes. Um, and, you know, but you're also trying to learn from, you know, both the, the craft side of things, but also the artistic side and learn from people who've come before you. And, and as you noted, there's a lot of photographers who are, you know, who are at an age where in a lot of professions, you'd be retired by now. <laughs> and either they're still working professionally, or even if they're not still working professionally, they're still doing personal work. I mean, one of the, um, uh, you know, I did a, an interview earlier this year with Joe McNally here, and I'll, I'll, I'll drop a link down below for folks that want to go look at that. And, you know, I don't know exactly how old Joe is at this point, but, you know, he's at an age where in a lot of professions, you know, you'd be retired and you look at the work he's still doing, the, you know, the work he's doing for Nikon and the work he's doing just directly. And, you know, he's making some amazing images still that are, you he's, know, he's, he's totally ageless and he's, right. he's such a, a mansion. You know, you talk about passion. Um, you feel the passion whenever you hear him speak oh, and yeah, teach. Yeah. You know, he just loves what he does. And, you know, frankly, you know, when you're doing what you love, you know, it doesn't feel like work. And, right. and, and you know, <laughs> he spent a whole career. And I think for a lot of us, you know, uh, it, it, our cameras, so we follow our cameras into these really interesting uh, scenarios in life. It gets us out of our comfort zone. And, you know, from the age perspective, you know, I often point to the idea that, uh, you know, in other uh, artistic pursuits like music, for example, I don't know if I'm kind of a Beatles fan and I uh, I saw the Get Back documentary. We see the Beatles sort of at their peak at 27. Mm -hmm. And I saw I saw Paul McCartney more recently uh, here in Brooklyn. Well, in Brooklyn, I'm in Manhattan um, and he's 80 now and he played for two and a right. half hours. He's an amazing artist. But in music, you know, there's something about that sort of huge talent 
uh, the 10,000 hours they put in and the energy of youth that creates the kind of final result that is harder to replicate as you get older. But when I look at my sort of heroes in photography, like Elliot Erwood or Joe McNally, mm -hmm. Jay Mizell, and these guys, right, you, know, right. and, you know, not Joe, he's younger, but, you know, Jay Mizell's 90. Right. You look at the work that they're doing, and it's, it's, it's amazing, which gives me sort of promise that uh, even though I'm of a certain age, there's still room to kind of push and, and get better at things, you know? So yeah. um, to me, that's exciting. Yeah, that that creative brain can still work. You know, the 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 knowledge you have of how to use your camera, of how to see light, of how to understand things still works. You know, you just you just maybe you need more assistance to schlep your gear around as you get older. Exactly. But, yeah. um, if I bend down but, for low angle, might need a little help getting up. But right. Beyond that, you know, uh, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Right. So uh, you've been in kind of the photo education world for a while now. And like all of us who are intermixed with education and speaking and training and all that, um, you know, we're kind of at an interesting place here as we record this in 2022. Um, you know, we, the pandemic occurred, um, you know, depending on where you were, you were in kind of a, a lockdown mode for a while. There weren't you know, there weren't any in-person events, in-person photo education kind of took a pause, just like in-person everything took a pause. Um, but, you know, now we're in 2022, and for the most part, in-person stuff has resumed. It doesn't always look exactly the same way that it did pre-COVID, but stuff is happening. I, you know, I've been to in-person events. I've given in-person talks this year. Mm. Um, you're going on a workshop here in, you know, tomorrow and going on another one in a month. Um, yeah. like everyone having been through all this, I guess kind of, you know, we showed, you know, everybody showed that some education can work online, right? Everybody yeah. pivoted online. And in some cases that I think that was very successful and that people were still able to learn things regardless of where they were at, you know, that we did it over Zoom, we did it over calls like this one. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, even as the biggest proponent of tech, right, I'm the tech photo guy, mm -hmm. there's still something about being in person, especially for certain types of subjects and certain types of education that that just really can't be replicated on a webcam. What's, mm -hmm. you know, what's your take on kind of what, you know, what worked well online, what might yeah. still work well online, yeah. but what really needs to be in person or where the, the student and the instructor are going to get the most out of that? Yeah, I think when, when I was, you know, doing destination workshops, you know, like your, you know, the commercial side of your business, obviously with COVID, it stopped, there's no travel. So the pivot to online was out of necessity. Um, and uh, in the end, now that we're back, and I've, I've done a few workshops, I did one in London and one in Milan, and it's now a, a hybrid model that I use. So we will have a, a class online. Uh, I'll do a lecture. We'll have all the participants join online. We'll look at their work. We'll, I'll deliver that first lecture. And it's a chance to kind of meet people because they're coming from different places. We all get together. We find a time mm -hmm. and we do the Zoom meeting. And um, that is a great introduction because when we get to the place, like for instance, Lisbon, when the workshop begins, we've already had our lecture. We know who's who. We've had our questions and so on. So we can kind of hit the ground running and maybe spend more time when we do the classroom portion uh, devoted to the critique of the images we're making in the field, which I think is one of the most beneficial aspects of sort of being there and shooting and then talking about what worked and then going out again and making things better. So the hybrid model, I think, uh, is something that I'm incorporating in my destination workshop so that at the end of the workshop, mm -hmm. um, we're, you know, the last day we're shooting up into the end. And, and also we don't really have the time to fully edit our work because we want right. to be out there shooting. Right. So then we do a post workshop class online for a couple hours. There's sort of a lecture, a critique and so on. And it just makes the experience even more enriching, I think. And that's really sort of a blessing, if mm -hmm. you will, of the COVID experience. Yeah. And then the other thing I would say, Aaron, is I've done a lot of, uh, I'm also, as much as you know, the, the camera's the tool like you, uh, the artifact, the, the camera itself, 
I'm a Nikon guy, and I do a lot of these Nikon classes. And actually, just yesterday, I did my six-hour marathon Nikon Z9 <sighs> online class. Okay, yeah. So that's proven to be uh, quite a good thing for me, um, because as you know, you know, teaching uh, is a two-way situation in that you right. know you have to know, you have to learn to be able to be one step ahead of the students. <clears throat> I would often do these one day or two day uh, Nikon specific classes in person. And I found that the online experience, there's really no downside uh, to the online. And mm -hmm. if anything, there's a big upside. People don't have to travel. They right. can watch the show in their underwear. They can watch the class. And in terms of the delivery, because we're all in this together, it's really not all that different because those technical classes are not you know, they don't really involve shooting. Right. Um, so right. I'm able to sort of, you know, go through that. I video, you know, I tape everything so they can review it later. I send them all the, the settings for the camera so they can populate uh, their menu mm -hmm. system before we start. So I, I think, you know, in many ways, uh, that's a very positive online experience. And as long as there's a need, so I added another Nikon Z9 class in November. As long as people sign up, I will devote those six hours yeah, to do yeah. it. And every class, you know, I learn more and I invite people to come back to the following classes and we learn from them. So I think we have to sort of look at the positive side of things. There's a lot of advantages that have come mm -hmm. out. People that aren't so tech, tech savvy as you, you know, find that they have to get to a certain level to be able to mm -hmm. do what they need to do. So. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that that subject matter a lot of times will be the key, right? You know, if I'm teaching, you know, so one of the things that I sometimes teach about is event photography, right? I can teach the business parts of that just as well over Zoom as I can standing in a room, you know, talking to people face to face, right? We can talk about contracts. We can talk about working with the venues. We can talk about, you know, considerations for what you should ask the client in advance. We can talk about, you know, delivery and, you know, you know, when you need a second shooter and when you don't. We, we can have that all discussion just fine over Zoom. Hmm. If we want to talk about or demonstrate or really learn, okay, how do you deal with stage lighting as a photographer? How do you deal with the impromptu, oh, hey, let's do a quick grip and grin over here on the fly, you know, type of shot? That hands-on aspect of it, you know, that is, you know, the bandwidth of doing that in person. I can communicate so much more when I'm not just talking to the computer or maybe holding up a camera. But when I can show people, you know, when I can be like, hey, look, if we move this person, you know, if we turn them, you know, 45 degrees compared to where the light already is, here's what that results in with the photo, right? If I'm teaching posing, if I'm teaching, you know, anything like yeah. that. And, yeah. you know, same type of thing, you know, for your subject, right? If you're teaching somebody how to use the camera, I could see where that that can be effective online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, and, you know, the other thing, too, is like we're talking now, we're having right. this interactive conversation. But YouTube, when it's posted to your channel, right. uh, people will watch and they'll ingest. And I think there's something different uh, from sort of the live Zoom meeting mm -hmm. versus the passive looking right. at something. I mean, it's right. very valuable. And we see how popular YouTube is. Mm -hmm. But there's an extra level of... Uh, being there mm -hmm. while it's happening, even though you may be in your living room or wherever you might be, that live aspect of things is still something I think, you know, as humans, uh, you know, are, are uh, it's something we need. I think it's right. important. And it, I think it can be more beneficial when you can actually ask a question rather than just sort of take take in uh, more passively what you're you're watching. Right. Yeah. That interactivity is good because, you know, I mean, and Obviously, people that are going to watch this on YouTube at some point in the future, they can enter. You know, I mean, they can leave a comment down below if they've got a question or a follow up item. Or I mean, and and if you're watching yeah. this and you do, please do leave a comment down below, right? And if you're finding this interesting, you know, please do subscribe to the channel down below so you'll get more interesting stuff. But um, but that's not quite the same, right? If if the instructor or you know if me or you or whoever is giving a, a pre-recorded video, and I know you've done some of those for people like you know Lynda.com and things like that, mm -hmm. you know, if the student is sitting there thinking, oh, well, I'm oh, I'm ninety percent of the way there, but you know, if I could just ask this question, you know, that to fill in that ten percent, you know, not having that interactivity. 
you know, is the downside. And, you know, yeah. and so having that interactivity, whether it is live on Zoom or a, a live stream or, you know, or obviously a face to face in person experience, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, really just ramps that level up. And so like with a destination workshop like the one. So the one you've got coming up here in November 2022 is to Tokyo. Um, why don't you just, you know, give the, you know, the short little plug of exactly what that is. And then, you know, from that, I'm, you know, I'll probably have a kind of a follow on question around the education sure, side of sure. it, but tell us what yeah, you're doing. Okay. The Tokyo workshop, we were set to go to Tokyo for this workshop, just as the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. it was March of 2020. So <laughs> right. this is kind of a bit of a bookend. Hopefully, uh, Japan just opened up literally a couple of days ago. It, you didn't need any kind of visa or special um, uh, uh, permission mm -hmm. with a Japanese travel agency so people can, you know, North Americans can do it. Uh, I'm, I love Tokyo, by the way. I mean, obviously, um, I'm a bit of a, a geek when it comes to equipment and Nikon is there and I've got my Nikon camera. But, but um, this particular workshop is, is the photo book workshop. And why I'm most excited is it's a little more advanced in the set. We're going to be in Tokyo for a week. And uh, the group is going to be going to various places within Tokyo. There's plenty there. I mean, in Japan, uh, there's a lot to explore. But Tokyo itself is just such a, uh, an amazing place to, to be and photograph. With the idea of creating a set of pictures that we're going to um, curate into a book. And my partner, Suichi Hayashi, who's an amazing photographer and a great guy, um, has hired uh, a Japanese photo book editor for this workshop, and we're going to work with her. The main thing is to go out and to shoot, but we're going to meet every day. We're going to edit our stuff, and we're going to learn from her. And the goal is to kind of have a rough template of that final book uh, by the end of the week. It's, nice. it's, it's kind of a big ask. Um, but I think uh, it's kind of exciting. We don't have to have it finalized, of course. You know, the main thing is to be out there and to be shooting and adding the content to it. But the idea of sort of looking for a theme or an idea, and it could be as general as the umbrella of Tokyo, and maybe it's your love letter to Tokyo, or it could be a very specific idea of the frenetic busyness of Tokyo mm -hmm. or maybe quiet places. We really want to you know, encourage uh, photographers to find a personal way to to uh, describe their experience in Tokyo and put into this book. So it's a little bit different from the normal workshops because this one right. is focused on the book. So it's a little more advanced. Um, and at the same time, Tokyo is amazing. Uh, we go to the Nikon Museum. Likely we'll find time in between to do that. Um, and uh, And the other thing, too, is I was surprised to learn you know, the Nikon Z9, which I do that course, it's a 5,500 US dollar camera. Um, because of the currency, and for whatever reason, the American currency is so strong, that $5,500 camera is $4,300 in Japan. Mm. That's a huge difference. Right. So <laughs> if you're looking to buy big ticket items, of course, it's gray market, so you may not get it serviced. Right. But there's, there's, a, there's a big difference with the currency. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Yeah, the dollar is the more really you strong spend, right now. The more you save. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And I love that photo book angle on things because I feel, you know, I feel like a lot of times some photographers, you know, I talk to them and they feel like they've gotten to a certain level where like, well, I don't know that I'm going to learn that much at a workshop. And that's something where, I mean, even if somebody is, you know, a professional expert photographer, they can go in, bring that expertise, bring their take on their Tokyo experience and contribute to that, that book project. I, I love yeah, that I, angle. I, yeah, just to add to that, because as you say, you know, you've been doing photography a long time, you have all these pictures, but when you start to think about how to combine pictures and create a set of pictures and mm -hmm. a narrative from that set, you use the same chops that provide the success that you've had up until now as a photographer, but you sometimes find that, you know, you're kind of shooting the same thing over and over again. So in order to tell the story, you have to kind of peel the onion and go into new territory for you in terms of telling that story photographically, because you don't want to have two similar pictures. You have to right. choose a stronger one. So the idea of sequencing and how one picture next to the other equals like, you know, an exponential uh, communication. The sequencing is important, which pictures need to be on their own, which pictures need to combine to tell a greater story. So all the photographic chops that you think you have, mm -hmm. 
you will learn how to sort of amplify that by putting together a book. And I know, uh, you know, your book is not necessarily a photo book, right. but in order to sort of tell a greater story, it's a lot different than, you know, sort of uh, your normal kind of pursuits. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. And I think that's something it, it's interesting when I talked, um, I had a conversation with, uh, David Ulrich a few months ago, um, after his book, the mindful photographer was released. And, uh, he talked about kind of that curation and then that sequencing and selection as being important. And I think too often as photographers, we focus on kind of the immediate capture and the edit, you know, and the, by edit, I just mean the, you know, the post-processing work on a given image, you know, but we don't think about the edit in the larger sense of which of these images do I share? How do I share them? And, you know, and a book is a great way to, to force you to think about that and to make those decisions. So yeah, that sounds really interesting. So if you're watching this video in late 2022, <laughs> um, Steve does have some space left on that workshop. Um, I'll drop a link down below. And you know, if you go sign up, let Steve know you heard about it from me um, from this video. But uh, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. I wish uh, I wish I had nothing else going on and was able to join you because you know, I'm that seems like it'd be a great experience. And I'll, I'll also drop links down below to just Steve's website in general. You can find out more about him, find out about his book, The Passionate Photographer, um, and check this out. And it's funny how these interviews always go so fast. It's like, what are we going to talk about? And now all of a sudden I'm like, we need to, you know, we need to, to, to button this up. So it's been great talking with you, Steve. Is there anything else, you, anywhere else we should send people to, to find out more or did we cover it? Uh, I think we covered it. Thank you so right. much, Aaron. It's it's great to reconnect with you because yes, it's been yes. a while since uh, we were in touch. But uh, I appreciate you, and uh, yeah, I we'll we'll continue the conversation. I'm sure another time. Excellent, excellent. So yeah, thanks again, everyone. Do subscribe down below so you can get notified the next time I post another conversation or tech topic. And uh, as always, take care. <laughs>